I did not know this, but the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is officially recognised as having the longest name of any country in the world. My goodness. Hi, it's Shebs here from Shebs the Wanderer, helping you to wander, discover, explore. Now, I'm super excited to have the amazing Lola Akinmedi Akastron on with me today. She is a writer, photographer. She has done so much in the industry. As I said to you, I'm super excited to have her. Uh, she's had some of her work published the likes of the National Geographic, the BBC. And before I chat to Lola about her career up to now and what the future holds for her going forward, let me show you what really launched her career. Her photography. Lola doesn't just stick to a specific type of photography as she varies her work. There is a sheer element of beauty as you can tell from some of these snaps. They are absolutely outstanding. So let's take a look. Hi Lola, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. How, how is everything, by the way, in Sweden? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And you know, Sweden is kind of calm right now. I mean, it's, it's the summer. But also with what's going on in our, with our COVID response, you know, it's a bit unconventional. So it's, it's been two feelings here in Sweden, one of just enjoying the summer, but at the same time, you know, enjoy, trying to enjoy the summer against the backdrop of like looser policies compared to the rest of the world. So I don't know. I mean, Sweden is Sweden right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw that. So they've not really, you've not really had a lockdown. It's just been the local sort of taking up within themselves, I believe, and just sort of social distancing, is that correct? Yeah, so for the most part, the government has kind of issued guidelines and is putting the trust in the citizens to say, you know what, you guys know what to do in terms of socially distancing and being responsible citizens to each other mm -hmm. and, and doing what we can as individuals to kind of mitigate or stop the spread. Um, but the thing is, people are always, you're always going to find selfish people everywhere so you know and so that's why it's not working uh on represent right now so but i always want to know how it all began was it something that your parents did yes. traveling um, how did it all begin with yourself so i i come from a traveling family i mean my grandfather was in the shipping business he traveled all over the world my dad is a geologist uh, and he traveled a lot and so my first trip was before I was even one years old. And every year, you know, my, my family traveled. And I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. And we, we uh, just from a, an early age, I was always fascinated by kind of other cultures, what made us similar, what made us different. Geography was my favorite, you know, subject in, in school. So it was just a matter of time. And I knew this was going to be like my natural evolution into doing something that required me to travel and explore. And so it wasn't until when I moved to the US and in 2002, I volunteered with an expedition race. And that race was in Fiji. And my job at the time was to write articles and follow the competitors around and describe what was going on in Fiji and the amazing places we were kind of exploring. That was when I started connecting the dots with kind of travel writing as a potential career. Right. And then once I moved, you know, got back from that uh, fun assignment, I started digging more and, and exploring ways I could get my stories out, my explorations out through words. And then with photography, that kind of came as an add-on because when I traveled, I took picture, pictures mm -hmm. to come paint because I used to be an oil painter. And so oh, okay. when I took those pictures, I, I brought them back to paint. And then after a while, I said, you know what? I'm duplicating effort. Let me explore photography as that, you know, medium of, of um, communication or expression. And so that's kind of how both travel writing and photography slowly came into my life, you know. And that's actually really fascinating because my um, major was in art itself. Oh. So I used to do very, very <laughs> similar where I used to take pictures 
come back and paint it. Yes. And then I kind of stopped it when I went to university. And it was more um, just the videography, photography. And I just, I, I dropped the painting from that. Mm. So it's actually interesting to hear that you went down the same sort of yeah, path yeah. With, the, with the photography and taking it and t painting and everything. So it's uh, always good to hear others yeah. uh, doing the same <laughs> thing. So, um, so as you were saying that you went to uh, the States, so uh, born and raised in Nigeria, is that correct? Yes, yes. So when you moved across to the States, uh, whereabouts did you first move to? So I moved to Maryland, you know, and I had Maryland, extended yeah. family there. And so that was where I went, um, you know, for both my degrees. I got yeah, at University of Maryland. And before I actually fully got into travel writing and photography as a full-time kind of job, I used to work as a programmer and I used to work as a software architect in a field called geographic information systems that worked with maps and creating interactive maps. So, and I did that for over 12 years before I finally kind of, um, quote unquote, followed my dream of being a travel writer and photographer. Traveling has always been an interest for myself. Uh, however, um, to actually dream of doing it, I, guess, I, I, think, I think sometimes you sort of doubt yourself, but it sounds like you've got no doubt in what you do and you're very bold in what you do and, and you just think to yourself, I, I believe in myself. Yes. Let's go ahead and, and do it. Would that, would I be correct in saying that? I would say so. Um, and the thing is, I mean, that doesn't mean I'm not never so afraid or, you know, when I'm in situations where I feel, you know, by my head, but I, I come from a place of strong conviction. I know what drives me. I know what my passion is. And, you know, it really has to do with, connection and culture and trying to fight isolation, you know, within my uh, sphere of influence and through my work. So that has always guided me as I moved from career to career, switch to switch, is knowing that I'm, I'm looking for that point of connection. Be and, and it also kind of harkens back to growing up in Nigeria, where we have over 500 different tribes speaking like over 250 different languages and dialects yeah. and for me it's always it's always came down to culture not so much race but just culture and the differences in culture and the way we navigate the world and then because we all have to live together in lagos which is like lots of different tribes and mm -hmm. cultures in a in a in that city then you learn how to respect and navigate and and recognize each person's difference, but also connect on similarities so that we can all live in a respectful way. And so that kind of reasoning has always been, you know, kind of underpin my work, you know, as a writer, as a photographer, that's what I look for. When I, when I take photos of people, how can I create a connection with the, the subject so yeah. that people see them first, you know, look into their eyes first, connect with them as a person first, before looking at the environment where they're standing. And in my writing, it's letting my characters truly speak for themselves because we all have, we all have our own voices. I'm not giving a voice to the voiceless. Everybody has their own voice. It's a matter of being quiet enough so that they can speak and you can hear their voice. So th that's kind of how everything underpins my work as a travel writer and photographer. And you've had so much recognition with the likes of National Geographic, the BBC. Um, I mean, you've also won numerous awards as well. Um, to get that recognition and to be, I mean, as we all know, there's been issues in the world lately with, and there's been the Black Lives Matter movement yes. now. As a woman of color yourself, and you, and you see this now, did you ever have any setbacks because of your, or of, your, of your skin tone or has, have you always sort of thought to yourself, I don't care about what people say, I'm just going to do whatever I can and my work will just speak for, you know, what would, yes. what would you say to that? Well, so the setback isn't because I'm a black woman, it's because there's structural racism, right? And so that's what's stopping me, not because I look a certain way, it's because this is the system that's been put in place to mm. disen you know, disenfranchise me. And especially as a black travel photographer, you know, and, and, a, and a black travel writer, but with being a black travel photographer, trying to convince editors that they need to choose me over a white guy that looked like he just came down Everest or rugged, 
to go shoot an assignment. That is what I have been working very hard within the travel kind of industry to fight because my work is comparable. My work speaks for itself, but then there is the image of what everybody feels like a travel writer or travel photographer needs to look like. And so that has been the struggle, kind of my struggle within the industry is to show that my work is comparable. I've got a strong portfolio and I don't even have access to an inch of the resources my peers have. So imagine if I had access to those resources and I'm still thriving, you know, and I'm still working really hard. And so with the Black Lives uh, Matter revolution, a friend of mine said it best. She said 2020 was the year we, we went from being on scene to being seen right away. But we've always been there. So what all of a sudden makes us appealing now? Why is our work more appealing? Because the work has always been there. Yeah, the exactly. Never changed. Absolutely. You know, so, so that's kind of the, um, what I've found fascinating about this is now all of a sudden the industry sees you as somebody what looking at, but you've moved emotionally past that point because it's no longer about seeking validation from an industry that never really wanted to validate you, but putting out the work that's your own mission that you've always believed in. And I think for me, that's what has been able to help me thrive is having that mission and knowing that this is what uh, kind of staying consistent with the thread in my work all the years. So body of work that you've done. So, I mean, you've got the Nordic TB um, and you've just recently okay. launched your academy as well. Yes. You've got various book that, books that you've published as well. I mean, what sort of pleases you the most? I mean, obviously, they're all sort of pleasing aspect of your career so far, but what would you look, look at and go, you know what, this, is, this was a hard slog. I'm so happy that I've achieved this. And obviously, there's more to achieve, of course. There's, there's yes. still... Well, everything has been a hard slog because I'm an, a black African woman, <laughs> right, in a world that's set up to set up against me really yeah. and so it's been very difficult everything has been very difficult for the most part but what has been really validating is seeing that it's getting easier for the next generation you know so my set it was a lot difficult but now as more kind of the newer travel writers black travel writers and photograph black travel photographers are coming on then it's getting easier for them that is what we do right each generation makes it a little bit easier for the next so that we get to the point where it no longer becomes the first black or the first black mm -hmm. it now becomes oh just that amazing photographer yeah. and and the color of their skin has nothing to do with it so for me that's the that is what gives me joy is actually seeing like the next wave of travel photographers and and uh, travel you know writers having access to things easier than I had it because I worked hard to help open Not up sure. those doors. You're sort of yeah. paving the way, aren't you, for the yes. next generation. Exactly. Uh, and, and, then... and it's the way that the generation before me paved it for me as well. So it's just, that's how it goes. Yeah. Absolutely. As I said, you're an inspiration to myself because I mean, I've been following your work for a few years and, Thank you. and then to all of a sudden talk to you is just a pleasure anyway. <laughs> um, just explain what is Nordic TB. I mean, okay. what's it about? What does it represent? If someone was, if you were to ask, if someone was to ask you for the first time, okay. what would you, how would you explain it? Yeah. So Nordic TB is just one venture in all the different ventures I do. And so Nordic TB is um, kind of a, a collective of visual storytellers in the Nordics, where we work with different brands and travel destinations to create kind of unique content, unique storytelling content that's more authentic. So it's also kind of like branded marketing, you know, but using independent visual storytellers. So an example of one of the big projects we worked on is a region up in Northern Sweden that wanted to promote itself with five regions in Finland called mm. Kraken. And so what we did was again, write articles, shoot kind of promo videos, create lots of like little teaser videos and create an image bank so that that destination has a full content bank that they can use to market themselves. So those are kind of the projects we do. That kind of work, if they had just hired a marketing agency, it would have been so 
like glossy polished like it would have felt soulless like the way you see travel branded things but by hiring us and working with them we're able to make it richer just more authentic real where we were able to create connection through the work as well so that's kind of what we do in addict tv is trying to create deeper connections through visual storytellers for mm. brands and destinations i mean you've got various i mean we can talk about your work for hours and hours but um <laughs> Recently, you launched an academy. Is that, that correct? Just explain what that is. So um, uh, over the years, I've been traveling around as a keynote speaker and running workshops and sessions on writing, storytelling, you know, photography, just at different places and around the world. And so the academy was a way for me to pull all that knowledge in a central location where people can go and access and buy self-guided courses or Later this year, I'm going to launch interactive masterclasses. And this is something that people have been asking me to do for years. Like, when are you going to launch a course? When are you going to launch something so that we can get that knowledge and we don't have to go to this conference or go sit in this workshop? Yeah. So, that's the, so what the academy is, is pretty much just all my knowledge, all my years and decades of experience, you know, boiled down into ways people can, can use to improve their own work and... And like I say, put the hat back in the craft, you know, so. And the, the course itself, um, where, where can people potentially go by? Is it through yeah. your website? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, in, and I, I can share the link with you, but akimade.com slash academy. And it's right now I've got four courses up and we're going to be putting up new courses every couple of weeks, you know. So it's, it's an academy that's going to have lots of different courses that's going to touch on branding, on writing, storytelling, on photography, as well as some one-on-one -on -one mentorship as well. So. And obviously you just recently launched it. Where would you like to see it sort of head to? Making sure that it's serving the people I want it to serve. And so I see it just growing, you know, with a lot more students, with a lot more offerings, as well as inviting instructors so that there are collaborations where I don't create all the courses myself. I can actually bring in, you know, colleagues that I respect and they can teach courses yeah. based on their own niche and area of expertise. So for me, it's making sure that it's providing value and really helping in practical, actionable ways, you know, for people to kind of improve their craft, you know. And if it gets world recognition, that's just like cherry on top of the cake kind that's of situation. Cool. But for now, it's making sure it serves who it needs to serve. Absolutely. And you've written many books uh, about your about your work. Um, I mean, from if if I was to ask you which book um, you would recommend for me to pick up first. What, which, which one would you suggest first for me to read? So I will pick up Do You Not, um, which is my self-published book. And it's my kind of travel. It's like a collection of travel stories and observations and photographs and snapshots over 20 years. And it's divided into North, East, South and West, you know. So that is a book that I will say that shows some of my writing style and the way I navigate and approach the world as a travel writer and photographer. And that book happened to win the uh, Travel Book of the Year 2018 from the Society of American Travel Writers. So wow. that's a huge award, you know, from your peers. Of course, absolutely. And then, and then the other book is Logum, which is, um, you know, diving into the Swedish mindset as well. And it's a very nuanced book that shows you what it's like and some of the things you could learn, some of the things you don't want to learn, you know. <laughs> so that's another book. And then I have a third book, which I can't share too much about, but the press release is going out soon. <laughs> Ooh. So, yeah. Exciting. Can't, and it's fiction. Wait. It's fiction. So I'm excited about that one. But with everything that you've done, you, you are now married and yes. live in Sweden. Um, how did you meet your husband? Was it through work? Was it? No, no. I met him. I actually met him online in 2006 through like a oh. dating website. That's how we oh, wow. met. It was Match.com. And remember 2006 was what 14 years ago was 14 that... yeah actually you know what 2006 for for dating online is actually yeah. quite yeah it's still sort of new isn't it it was and... very new and there was a lot of stigma attached to it as well exactly but now yeah. every, everyone does yeah. it and stuff. exactly uh, so, and so you know what yeah. you know what was what's, what's I, I had i've had guests in the past when we've spoken about how 
can you find love when your love is travel? Mm. Because a lot of my friends, I mean, I'm still single. Um, you think, oh, if I get married, it's going to affect my travels. You know, it's going to affect my maybe career. But it doesn't seem to stop you because you're still doing everything that you love doing, if, if not more. You also got kids now. So yes. how do you balance yeah. all of that all in, in one? Yeah. Well, and you know what? I'm really grateful because I live in Sweden, which has a little bit more of a flexible work-life balance situation. You know, I'm grateful because my husband right now is a lot more flexible. He's in, he's, he used to be a journalist for many years, you know, which means he's not a multimillionaire, you know, and he used to be a journalist for many years and then he quit and went back to school. So him being back in school is making it flexible and he can be with the kids. And then it's about really planning and organizing. Like I can't go on assignments for two weeks, you, you know, might. when I, you know, so it's about, and even if I do, then it's something that has to be really planned and well worth going on that kind of two week assignment. Of course. Cause you've got to think about your, your kids. Exactly. Now. That's and priority. Yeah. Of course. Now, and with, the, I guess when you're not working and you can't take time off, you obviously now travel with your kids. Yes. Um, what sort of destinations would you now, obviously you, can't, you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily go to places where you would have done when you were single, when you were married as, as a couple. Well, well, so, well the thing is that, I mean, I travel with my kids mostly for vacation and just, pri like I don't really take them on assignments because I still work as a professional travel photographer. So I do go mm -hmm. on assignments. I do go on, you know, like, remote places that one of my assignments was to Greenland and the Faroe Islands. I mean, I do go on those assignments. I just plan them right. And even if they're a bit long, like if they're like eight days or, you know, I, I really plan them so that it's not, so I don't do too many long assignments every year, you know, it's, and so, um, but when I go on vacation with the family, it's usually just somewhere relaxing, cool, where, you know, or if it's somewhere that one of them is excited about, for example, my daughter is fascinated by Japan. So I took her, just me and my daughter to Japan, you know, for like a mother-daughter yeah. uh, trip. So I do that and I take each one of them, you know, my son really loves London. So I just took him, me and him, you know, okay. so I, so I, that's how I kind of introduced the world to them. I don't make it this grand, big novelty. I make it part of our lifestyle, you know. If we all go together, great. If it's just me and one of them, great. You know, if it's just mom on assignment, sure. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how we weave travel into our that's lives. Interesting to hear, actually, that you don't actually take them together. It can. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that. So. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually for all parents listening. <laughs> the advice: Can you pinpoint a favorite place that you've that that sort of always sticks in your mind, or is it too hard? I, I never say a uh, favorite place, but I just say maybe favorite or me memorable experiences because each place is just so unique and dynamic. And if I say this is my favorite, then it kind of discounts all the wonderful experiences I had somewhere else. So I always say kind of favorite experiences in different places. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. just actually, you talked about the um, some of your work as well. And you mentioned like assignments in like Faroe Islands and yeah. because and, I actually spoke to someone the other day about Faroe Islands and uh, there's a big topic and I think um, the BBC covered it recently about maybe over tourism yes. um, and this is something I've been looking into I'm, I'm going to do a bit of a, a thing on this um, obviously t travel has grown over the last 20 mm. years um, can places like Faroe Islands, they, they obviously can't sustain it because if they've got a population of 50,000 people and there's 200,000 people going there, yeah. how, how do we tackle this sort of? Correct. As, a, as obviously it's a market that's constantly growing. How can yes. we tackle this? Well, I mean, this is a complex topic, right? Because I mean, it has so many different angles. I mean, one could be even from price points to deter people to even limiting the season when tourists are allowed to come in. And so there are so many kind of talking points around over tourism. And I think places like Faroe Islands, I don't think they are dealing with that yet. You know, I think it's places that are more like Venice, you know, Italy and yes. where, where, they, where they take busloads of people or like cruise ships land. And yeah, absolutely, the cruise ships are the big problems because yes. they take tens of thousands of people actually did they, they don't necessarily add anything to the economy either exactly exactly how do you tackle that though i know i know and that's a huge industry and that's an industry that you know even though many people would want <laughs> to kind of go away yep. isn't going to go away because because it's also uh people it's trying to expose the world even if it's filtered 
to some people as well. So it's a very kind of complex topic that we can't even solve in <laughs> in our in this talk. No, this is absolutely no, it's, it's for another time. And one last question I've got to ask you. I mean, you've taken so many photo photographs. Have you got a favorite? You know, I have two favorite photos, but the one that just pops into mind, I, I love photographing people, you know, just really connecting with the eyes. But it's this is actually of a Oski. You know, I went Oski sledding. This was oh. in Jokmak in uh, Sweden, northern Sweden. And there's a moment where the Oski turns around and looks at me and we just have this eye contact. Okay. And that shot is um, one of my favorite shots because it looks like it makes that dog feel like a human being, like we're just connecting. Plus, it's also one of the shots that kind of helped launch my career as well within National Geographic because it was that shot that a producer saw. It was a double yeah. page shot. You opened it up, boom, and that's the eye contact that uh, got me signed on to work on a project with National Geographic Channel and then get eventually get signed on, you know, by, by the image collection. So that shot is the one that just pops into mind. Any other, I know you mentioned you've got something coming up and you can't really say too much. Anything else that we can look forward to in your, in the next co well, coming years? Well, I mean, it's just a, to continue to evolve, you know, as a, as a storyteller, you know, as I, you know, as I also get older, it's just e evolving uh, organically. I mean, I'm going to be working on a lot more kind of entrepreneurial pursuits as well, you know, trying to get like an umbrella around all of this. I've got some assignments coming up, you know, and uh, I think my next travel now post-COVID is going to be to Finland uh, mm -hmm. in September for a photo assignment, you know, and so I'm just, I don't want to kind of look to find the future, but just kind of taking it one day at a time and organically evolving my brand and my way of storytelling and my way of kind of navigating the world, so. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to seeing it all and... Um... <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on, Lola. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, as I said, anyone listening in, surely they've drawn inspiration in what you've said. And uh, hopefully one day uh, our paths will cross and we meet. I always Absolutely. say that everyone. So um, the world's too small. Uh, that's why I always say so. Uh, but no, thank you very much for coming on. And um, pleasure, as I said to you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Wow, I just spoke to Lola. She is an amazing woman and what she's done for the industry is incredible. Perhaps if I can achieve one third of what she's achieved in the industry, I'll be super happy. That's it for another edition of Take a Wonder with Shebs. I hope you all enjoyed the show. Until next time, bye for now. Bye.